So I know I've been missing for quite some time and haven't uploaded for quite some time. So I thought I'd give you guys a double upload today. So this is the first upload of the day. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. I wanted us to actually look at a very important topic because this is actually considered as one of the emergencies in the neonatal period. Well, I wanted us to talk about neonatal hypothermia. Now keep in mind that when you talk about hypothermia, before I actually go into the slides, I just want to remind you that remember that the neonates actually have a, have a larger surface area to body, body ratio, body volume ratio, as compared to the adults. So it means that they have a larger surface area to lose the heat from the body. Number two, the neonate cannot actually choose to keep themselves warm or grab a blanket or anything, so there's already that constraint. And the third thing is that in some set of neonates, for example, in the preterm neonates, their skin is already thin, their thermoregulatory centers are not yet well developed to actually respond to this cold temperatures. In a normal adult uh, person, you're supposed to have these counter-regulatory um, mechanisms that are put into play to combat hypothermia and to prevent hypothermia. So remember that the normal rectal temperature in a term and a preterm infant is going to be between 36.5 to 37.5. And when we talk about hypothermia, contrary to most belief, the WHO actually defines it as a temperature that's less than 36.5. Not a temperature that's less than 36, but a temperature that's less than 36.5. So if you see a child with the temperature of 36, that's already considered as hypothermia. So there may be something that we refer to as cold stress because remember that at higher temperatures or even at lower temperatures rather the child is going to need to generate more metabolic processes in order to produce heat because they don't have these normal regulatory mechanisms like shivering and all those things that happen in older children or in, in adults so the counter regulatory mechanism is that they have to increase their metabolic rate so that they produce heat from the metabolic system so it puts this child in a, a state of stress which is what we refer to as cold stress so there are certain causes of hypothermia in the neonate. You can have environmental factors. Obviously, if the temperature is at a lower, uh, the room of the temperature is at a lower, lower temperature than normal. You may also have disorders that impair thermoregulation, things like sepsis, intracranial hemorrhage, drug withdrawal, or even a combination of these factors. And remember that uh, hypothermia is much more common in prematurity. Like I already explained, they have, they are, they are much smaller infants so that means they have a larger surface area to body volume ratio the second reason is that already their subcutaneous fat is not as much as the term infants the third reason is that their skin is actually quite thin so they can actually lose a lot of heat of course they deliver in an area with an environmental temperature that's below the recommended levels you may have maternal hypertension for some reason caesarean deliveries and children that are generally born with a low APCA score now what's the pathophysiology of hypothermia especially in neonates remember that you have this what we refer to as thermal equilibrium so this thermal equilibrium is a, a state where the temperatures of the environment are actually uh, leading to a normal metabolic function in this infants as they do not produce excess heat or they're not increasing their metabolic um, demands in order to compensate for that drop in temperature so the is this thermal equilibrium that depends on several factors it depends on the relative humidity it depends on the airflow of the room it depends on the direct contact to cooler surfaces even the proximity to a colder object and even any presence of ambient air temperatures in the room now remember that neonates like i said are prone to rapid heat losses why because they have a higher surface area to volume ratio this is even higher in the low birth weight uh, neonates is even higher in the preterm neonates and remember that heat can be lost in predominantly three ways you can lose it through radiation you can lose it through conduction you can lose it through convection so for example if you keep a child that's 
barely naked in a, a room that's uh, actually with an environment that contains objects that are at cooler temperature. Remember that heat is going to be moving from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. So this child will lose heat through radiation such that there is a thermal equilibrium where no heat is being transferred from one object to another. Then they also lose heat through evaporation where, for example, children are born, they were swimming in amniotic fluid in the pregnancy. So when they are born and that amniotic fluid actually evaporates from the body, remember it leaves the body temperature at a cooler uh, temperature. So we call this as the evaporative effect or the cooling effect of evaporation. Remember back in your physics. Then you may have conductive heat loss where the neonates are actually placed in contact with this cooler surface or an object, they transfer this heat through conduction. You may also have convection heat losses where you get this flow of cooler ambient air which carries the heat away from the neonates. So it means if you're in a room which is a bit with which has a slight breeze, there is a risk, which is why most of the NICUs will have the windows closed in most of the wards. Of course, there is some ventilation, but of course not with ambient air. Then remember that once you have this prolonged unrecognized stress, this is going to be um, causing the body now to divert the calories to producing heat. Okay, remember that the mechanism of which these neonates actually keep themselves warm is slightly different to the what we use as adults. So generally, we have this type of fat, which is found at the nape of the neck, it's in between the scapula, it's also found around the kidneys, it's found around the adrenals. This fat is ref what we refer to as brown fat. So in the neonates, they have a lot of this, especially in these areas. So what happens is that when the neonate now is, the body has realized that they are being exposed to these prolonged low temperatures, they're going to produce no epinephrine from the nerve endings. Sympathetic nerve endings are going to produce no epinephrine. Now this no epinephrine is then going to cause lipolysis, the breakdown of fats, followed by oxidation and re-esterification of these fats, such that now these metabolic Metabolic processes are going to result in heat being produced locally. And remember that this uh, brown fat is actually has a rich blood supply, so it can actually carry this heat that is being generated to the rest of the body, and that's how the neonate actually warms their body. Remember that they are incapable of shivering, so you refer to this type of compensatory mechanism as chemical thermogenesis or what we call non-shivering thermogenesis. Now remember that keep this in mind that you're breaking down fat and it means that all your ATP all your energy is being directed towards breaking down fat and remember this process of oxidation and re-esterification of the fats is pretty much increasing the metabolic rate it's increasing the oxygen demands by two to three folds. So this already creates a problem in already those neonates, especially the preemies that have respiratory insufficiency. For example, those that have respiratory distress syndrome, then this can actually even further worsen the tissue hypoxia. It can further worsen the neurological damage. Then you also have the activation of the glycogen stores that may happen where glycogen is converted to glucose, which may actually result in the transient phase of hyperglycemia. But in most cases, you get this persistent um, hypoglycemia with um, the... Uh, what do you call this with the hypothermia? You may also have a risk of metabolic acidosis, which increases the risk of late onset sepsis and mortality. Not only does the hypoxia worsen the hypothermia, but hypothermia also worsens the hypoxia because remember, hypothermia actually inhibits the production of surfactant. So if this production of surfactant is inhibited, this will further worsen the respiratory distress, this will further worsen the tissue hypoxia, and this will further worsen the hypothermia. So it's like a vicious cycle that you have created. So remember that despite this neonate having these compensatory mechanisms are not enough, especially in those that are low birth infants, they're not enough and there's only so much that the neonate can do to compensate. So even before these temperatures actually begin to decrease, the cold stress occurs when the heat loss actually requires an increase in the metabolic heat production. So we should actually place these neonates in what we call a neutral thermal environment where there is thermal neutrality. So what it actually is, what I like to call a neutral zone. So you, this is just pretty much an environment where you have the... The, the temperature of this environment where the metabolic demands and ex, in, in essence that's the caloric expenditure which is 
uh, needed to maintain the body temperature in the normal range, which is 36.5 to 37.5 rectally, is actually the lowest. So if you have such an environment or such a temperature, we refer to this as a neutral zone. So the neonates that are actually sick must be kept in this neutral zone, and most of the neonates admitted to the NICU must be kept at this zone. So it means you should be checking the temperature strictly of the environment and get enough heaters to keep it at a certain environment. Remember that this specific environmental temperature is required to maintain this thermal neutrality. It's going to depend on whether the neonate is wet, for example, just after delivery. It means even in the operative rooms, they're going to have a certain specific temperature that is recommended by the WHO. Or when they are clothed, depending on the weight of the infant, the gestational age, and even the age in hours or days. So what are some of the consequences of hypothermia? I already alluded to one of them. It causes respiratory distress syndrome. Remember that hypothermia inhibits or decreases the production of surfactant. Generally, hypothermia reduces most of the chemical processes and the metabolic processes in the body. It also causes hypoglycemia because all the ATP, all the energy is being channeled towards the uh, metabolism and production of heat. There is also hypovolemia and shock, which is even common in older children. How does this happen? Remember that hypothermia is largely associated with hypotension as well as bradycardia. Of course, this will cause some sort of shock. But in this case, remember that in most of the times when someone is immersed in cold water or whenever their body temperature begins to fall, there is this reflex that is going to happen to divert blood to the essential organs. In addition to this, there may be some renal cell dysfunction and even some decrease in levels of vasopressin which is ADH, which is being produced. So this child will often produce large amounts of urine, what we call cold diuresis. Notice how you tend to urinate more when it's cold than when it's hot. So this is actually, <coughs> excuse me, this may not uh, be actually evident in children because remember whenever there's cold, like I told you, there's that vasoconstrictory effect of the code. So you get this blood being redirected to the vital organs. However, when you now begin to rewarm this child and that there's that vasodilatation that happens back to normal, then the cardiac system, which was already depressed, is overloaded with a lot of fluid, especially coming from the periphery, and this can actually cause cardiovascular collapse, what we refer to as rewarming collapse. Then they may have hypoxia, like I said, which is often due to the respiratory distress, which is often, often due to the decrease in the, the production of surfactant. Of course, this may predispose the child to pulmonary hemorrhage. It may predispose the child to intraventricular hemorrhage. There may also be metabolic acidosis, which also predisposes to sepsis. There may be impaired growth because of or the heat is being channeled towards keeping the child warm, or rather the energy is being channeled towards keeping the child warm instead of growth. So what investigations do you need to consider? You want to do a full blood count to rule out any infections, a blood culture or a CRP, to rule out infections again because remember sepsis can also be presenting to you with hypothermia, UNEs and creatinine, get your arterial blood gases if you, if you may, a serum glucose estimation including a bedside estimation must be done. So how do we manage these children? We want to rewarm them in an incubator or under a radiant warmer. Make sure that the neonate is checked for hypoglycemia, they're checked for hypothermia, and they're checked for apnea. So remember, your hypoglycemia in our setting in the hospital, we're going to be using a threshold of about 3 millimoles per liter. But true hypoglycemia actually in the term infants is actually less than 2.6. And in the preterm infants, we actually even use a lower threshold than this. So whenever you have hypoglycemia, you manage that. So obviously, if they're feeding, you continue the feeding. You bolus them with your IV dextrose at 5 mils per kg. You check your oxygen saturation in your trio blood gases. If they're hypoxemic, put them on oxygen. If there is apnea, remember apnea is cessation of respiration for 15 seconds associated with bradycardia, put them on oxygen, ventilate them, stimulate them. Then treat any underlying cause. If there's sepsis, treat that. If there's drug withdrawal, treat that. If there's intraventricular hemorrhage, treat that. All those have specific treatments that are attached to them. So how do we prevent hypothermia? Remember that maintaining this appropriate uh, environment which the, where there is thermal neutrality, where there's no net loss or gain of the heat or um, any drop in temperature is optimal. This must be from the time the child is born. So according to the WHO, we actually recommend that the delivery rooms must be kept at a specific temperature. That's about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius. And these neonates actually must be dried immediately and placed in, on the skin of the mother, covered with a blanket on top. And of course, if it's a preterm infant who is hypothermic, then 
obviously if they're admitted to the NICU there's a higher chance of morbidity there's a higher chance of mortality so this must be reduced at time of delivery with some physicians actually or some obstetricians you will find out that they'll already even cover the child in a poly uh, polyethylene bag which is this clear plastic bag which uh, they don't even dry the child because this actually helps them prevent more heat losses but according to the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Heart Association we should keep these operating rooms where we're going to be delivering these preterm infants between 23 to 25 degrees Celsius and we should avoid actually rewarming or actually warming these rooms just when the delivery is about to be happening because this may actually result in the heat loss uh, from the cooler surfaces and convection of heat which is caused by this rapid airflow so we actually should maintain the temperatures at 23 to 25 at all times in these type of environments and then when the child is born if it's a term child you immediately dry them up swaddle them in a blanket and then of course keep them warm to prevent these evaporative conductive and convection losses for the preterm infants like i said covering them in a plastic bag you don't necessarily need to actually wipe them dry and of course a neonate that is exposed for resuscitation or any observation you must make sure that you're examining your neonates under a radiant warmer without anything blocking the heat reaching the infant things like blankets in order for you to prevent any radiant loss. Remember all the sick children should be kept in a thermal neutral environment to minimize the metabolic demands and of course a proper incubator temperature is going to vary based on the neonates birth weight the postnatal age and even the humidity of the incubator i really hope you enjoyed this lecture on hypothermia if you did please consider subscribing to the channel hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time i post to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time see you in the next lecture very shortly. Bye-bye.